This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Colonizing space might be about a future beyond Earth, but it may also save Earth. Or doom it. So it's Toki Day here on SFIA, and since Thanksgiving is always on a Thursday, and so are our episodes, I tend not to do Thanksgiving holiday specials like I sometimes do with other holidays. Thanksgiving is one of my favorites, partially because it's an excuse to stuff yourself to the gills with food and friends and family, but also because it encourages folks to survey their life and think about their good fortunes, rather than challenges and hardships. And as any channel regular can probably guess, I'm a glass half full sort of person. So we had the topic come up on one of our episode polls of how space colonization can save Earth. When I saw the topic idea, I thought, what do we mean by save Earth? A lot of times saving Earth and saving humanity are synonymous, other times they are unrelated or the exact opposite thing, saving one at the expense of the other. And I thought that's a good group of topics as a chance to look at not just current or potential threats we might need saving from, but to review how technology has often helped us with seemingly inevitable cataclysms or problems. However, I feel like we have to also look equally at the argument that technology, and even space colonization, is not what can save Earth, but potentially doom it. I've heard folks say that for every problem technology solves and invents another, and indeed that's probably conservative. But I feel that is like griping about every time you answer a question, two more spring to mind like the mythic Hydra. Every time I learn something new, I come up with new questions needing answers. And yet, I'm hardly running a hamster wheel or playing a zero-sum game. No matter how much I learn about science and the world, I'm still as confused as I ever was. But now, I'm confused on a higher level and about more important things. I think most of us feel the same. Our curiosity is a hunger never sated, but unlike glutting yourself at the Thanksgiving dinner table, asking questions and getting answers seems to have few downsides, except possibly a tendency toward feelings of existential dread. Indeed, if technology does often raise new problems, they are frequently existing ones we were just unaware of, or had fatalistically accepted as just being part of life. So I want to emphasize that today's topic is not just how space technologies can help, but the colonization itself. It goes without saying that if research in space leads us to discovering a cheap and abundant clean energy supply, space exploration helped Earth and its inhabitants, but that's rather like saying that dark matter research on the South Pole helps us, then arguing that colonizing Antarctica will save Earth. One argument against pushing out to other worlds is that while the experience might help us learn some new tricks, most of the things that help Earth won't physically come from space, just technology developed in the process that in many cases will require little to no actual space colonization, and there is some truth to that assertion. I wouldn't really call low orbital space around Earth space space. Virtually every satellite we have is closer to Earth than most countries are to their neighbors, and a few hundred kilometers of altitude to go outside the atmosphere drag isn't really colonizing space away from Earth any more than building on the bottom of the ocean or another continent is. Cell towers on very large mountains or helium balloons holding cell antennas or solar cells or wind turbines aren't really space colonization, and many of our needs that we associate to space colonization are satisfied just fine by a low Earth orbital presence. As an example, we have to worry about defending ourselves from asteroids and that is probably cheaper and easier if you have expanded around the whole solar system, but also adds other places you need to monitor and protect. And realistically, detectors and defenses in orbit of Earth are just fine. A big rock can come at us now, but we do already have the technology for detection and elimination, just not the infrastructure and I'd be hard pressed to justify spending money on missions away from near Earth as benefiting improvements to that, it's basically just a matter of bigger and cheaper eyes and guns. They are all definitely benefits for humanity to get away from being only on Earth, with literally all our eggs in this one basket, but there's really no natural disaster that could get us before we could throw some colony ships together that a decently good orbital detection grid wouldn't spot many years out. Even some dinosaur killer asteroid is no threat to humanity's continued existence, just our civilization, and most of our people, 
and a colony ship doesn't save humanity from either of those any better than some super bunker on the planet would. Indeed the latter would likely let you save way more people and have the planet back up to a good healthy ecosystem afterward long before any interstellar colony ship got to a new planet, let alone terraformed it. It will always be easier to re-terraform Earth than any other world, even ignoring that all our manpower and industry is already here to help. Now some minor planet a hundred kilometers across might change that equation, as might a rogue black hole entering our solar system, but it is phenomenally unlikely either could sneak up on us, or rather any civilization with sufficient tech and space capacity that they could contemplate sending a colony ship out. We would have seen such things centuries before they would arrive, and statistically improbable that either would occur within the next million years, let alone the next couple of centuries we need to develop our techs and orbital infrastructure. This leaves us with tons of other man-made calamities from doomsday devices to climatic ruin or rogue artificial intelligence and many more, but the thing about most of those is that having another planet doesn't help with them that much. An artificial intelligence that wants all humans dead can go get them on Mars or Alpha Centauri too. it presumably has equal or better spaceship technology than the civilization back on Earth that did that colonizing and which it defeated. Of course AI or aliens aren't the only threats to humans, and the other problem with colonizing space is that the new colonies will be full of the best known threat to humanity, which is to say, other humans. Most channel regulars would know that I wouldn't consider an alien invasion of Earth to be terribly likely. I'm skeptical of there being any spacefaring alien civilization in this galaxy or even supercluster, and it would be statistically improbable that one did exist, was conquest or genocide oriented, and just happen to pop up now, rather than say a million or billion years ago, or any time in between. So I'd rate the odds of Earth being invaded or blown up right now as astronomically slim, however, show me 100 colonized worlds and I'll show you at least 100 potential plausible invaders. I live in a country that's only a couple hundred years old and only has two neighbors, and we've invaded and been invaded by both, and we're traditionally friendly with both too. We were also principally colonized from a country we've been to war with twice since then, fought alongside many more times, and there's nothing unusual about any of that, quite to the contrary. Now you're probably saying to yourself, gee Isaac, I thought you were going to tell us how colonizing space can save Earth. And it's a good point to remember, saving Earth and saving humanity are not the same thing. Indeed the biggest threat to Earth in the short term is humanity. Kill all of us off and the planet will probably do okay without us at least until a bigger asteroid comes by and hits us, or a super volcano does, or until the oceans all boil off in about a billion years, or until the sun dies off and burns the planet ash in about 5 billion years, or a supernova or gamma ray burst gets us, or I'm wrong about aliens and they all matters are en route. A key notion there too is that there may indeed be alien civilizations in our galaxy, but they clearly aren't aggressively colonizing the place or super numerous. So the overwhelming majority of planets out there are dead, radiation-scarred, airless worlds whose only water is bound in ice or under ice. Many may have held life too, it is entirely plausible that life did evolve on Mars or Venus and just couldn't make progress on those worlds before Mars' atmosphere evaporated and Venus turned into a suburb of hell. We don't know nearly enough about other worlds and life originating on them to speak with any sort of authority as to what is normal. But I'd say the best guess right now is that most planets and big moons never get close to allowing life to form on them, and most of the ones that do never get any chance for life to get to where we are before that world dies. These are the great filters we look at in the For Me Paradox series, things that lower the odds of life being out there and chatty, that make the universe fairly devoid of life. We want to establish that point because there is a habit of folks to look at humanity and Earth and say we'd be better off without us, and that we just wreck any other worlds we went to, and I think we have to acknowledge that this viewpoint isn't hard to understand. Personally, I hate when folks refer to humanity like it was a swarm of locusts or a virus, or how Earth would be better off without us. Those sort of remarks resonate with many folks because they have a kernel of truth but they leave out the threats that humanity could protect Earth from, like asteroids and natural ecological collapse that more than likely end life on many other planets. But we can bring life to those planets and to ones where life could never have formed. For my part, I think we'll master genetics, ecology, and geoengineering before the end of this millennium, 
but if we didn't, then yes, the planet would be almost inevitably screwed, and then we can't even colonize other worlds, even ones that had life, oceans, and oxygen-rich atmospheres, so we can't export those specific kinds of problems because we first require the knowledge and tech that fixes and avoids such problems, in order to export them to new worlds. And in the balance of that, a planet without intelligent technological life is still thoroughly doomed. I don't like to anthropomorphize even though we did an episode on sentient planets not long back, but if one does take the perspective that it's humanity versus nature, it's probably important to keep in mind that the best evolutionary survival strategy in the long term is expansion from your native ecosystem to the world at large to be safe from local calamities or changes, and the same holds for getting off your home world to new worlds. We may be the first species to truly impair life on Earth, but Earth has been threatened before many times and is inevitably doomed for a variety of reasons having nothing to do with humans, though humans might be able to prevent or delay it. Only technology can extend its life, and the species on it, and could potentially extend that for millions and billions of years to trillions and quadrillions and beyond. See our episode Dying Earth and the rest of the Civilizations at the End of Time series for how to do that. For my part, I tend to see the human species that the Earth gave birth to, like unruly children who tax their mother's health and energy now, but can also take care of her health in her old age, not some nasty parasite or disease killing her. Now none of this changes that the biggest current threat to Earth is her unruly children. I think if you said there was a 1% chance humanity would wreck this planet in the next thousand years, most folks would say those are very optimistic odds. We do not need space colonization to save Earth from ourselves though, Indeed a million colonized world in the galaxy or a trillion inhabited O'Neill cylinders in a Dyson Swarm around our sun just increases the number of researchers able to develop doomsday devices, and the number of folks who might have motive, means, and opportunity to use them. Critically we are demonstrating that there's not too much about colonizing space that really hurts or helps us in protecting our own ecology and climate here on Earth. We can say that terraforming technologies developed for Mars or the Moon or Venus might help with our own problems here, and that is a decent and valid argument. But there is likely to always be more interest and funding for fixing an Earth-based environmental issue than some problem on a new and sparsely colonized planet. Colonizing the Moon or mining near-Earth asteroids gives us an ample supply of raw materials like aluminum or iron we can make solar shades and mirrors out of without paying the orbital cost of getting things up from Earth. That may make or break those sorts of climate engineering options from an economic perspective, but my guess is that it would not. The Moon's a great place to mine materials for building up in space, but we probably could opt to use a mass driver or some other cargo-heavy launch system for getting something like solar shades up to orbit from Earth-side mighty and manufacturing, and ditto power satellites. Earth itself already contains roughly the same material resources as all the other rocky planets, moons, and asteroids in our solar system combined. The reality is Earth will never really be reliant on off-world raw materials, though they may indeed be cheaper in some cases than extracting from, say, Earth's mantle, which is a gold mine far closer than the moon or any asteroid, and which has vastly more of it. We also have to keep in mind that the moon has only about an 80th of Earth's overall mass, and the asteroid belt in its entirety is roughly to the moon what the moon is to Earth, very little material there, just way more than we currently use. Virtually all of Earth's wealth is buried under kilometers of rock, hard to reach, but it is very debatable if hundreds of thousands of kilometers of space to the moon or hundreds of millions of kilometers to the asteroid belt is really easier to travel simply for being empty. Again though, lunar and asteroid resources are a big advantage for orbital infrastructure. It is just a bit hyperbolic to say access to those resources alone will save the planet, though in this case it might be literally accurate since it limits our need to carve out big chunks of the planet to make stuff. We don't really want to strip mine our planet, but you can use whatever cheap and dirty method you want for mining some godforsaken dead rock in space. Mass importation of raw materials to Earth itself, rather than orbital space, when we're talking about quantities representing significant fractions of a planet, is really only something we want to do if contemplating building Eucumenopolises on the extreme scale or a Matrioska shell world, which admittedly is probably two of the more likely scenarios for Earth's future. 
Being the center of an expanding galactic empire potentially opens some doors for extreme wealth and resources for enhancing our planet, many of which could save it or help do so. So basically, you only need external raw materials for Earth where you're building or lighting whole new layers of the planet. In such a case you really need to be able to move light and heat around at a grand scale too, and you really need that orbital or Lagrange network of mirrors, shades, and giant anti-asteroid guns for blowing up asteroids, or blowing up offensive ships. Mostly the latter too, as a high-tech civilization doesn't regard incoming asteroids as threats, except the stability of their commodities market, they just grab it and mine it for a reduced fuel bill. Even something like a rogue black hole headed toward Earth is manageable by a sufficiently muscular civilization, of course they need a space-based infrastructure to do that, and one heck of one to handle rogue planets and dead stars. Critical notion, to save Earth you either have to save humanity or replace it with some other technologically capable and ambitious option, and I wouldn't wager on AI thinking Earth or its ecosystem was any more valuable than we do. It might. Reality is not some sci-fi cliché where machine intelligence automatically despises biology and ecology and wants to turn the whole planet into computer banks or disassemble it. Nonetheless, the planet shouldn't be gambling any successor to humanity is going to do better in that steward role. So fundamentally, saving Earth is about saving humanity and here is where we get to why space colonization is really necessary. Locked up on one planet without room to grow or some new frontier to fight, we probably end up in some zero-sum battle amongst ourselves of a very Malthusian nature. Now you can keep improving efficiency locally, decreasing how much resources it takes to support a person, miniaturizing your technology and even your people, and we will examine that scenario from a Fermi Paradox perspective next week. But at a core level, if everyone is struggling for control of a set amount of resources in a set place we all already live on, it probably does not make for a friendly environment. Now on the flip side of that, a humanity stuck with only one world might be very motivated to carefully protect it and efficiently utilize it, and I do think it's overly cynical to assume we wouldn't be able to act that way, but I suspect I'm in a minority on that view and even I wouldn't call it a guarantee we would behave ourselves, just decent odds. Yes, utilizing raw materials on the moon and asteroid belt can help us build a robust orbital infrastructure. Yes. That permits climate and weather control via sunshades and economically too. Yes, it opens the doors to energy and resource abundance that eliminates the need to devote lands to strip mining, desertification, deforestation, or even biofuel production and solar farms. Indeed as we saw in space farming, that might turn out to be viable far enough down the road. And energy abundance and better automation allows options for farming that lets us use less farmland to do far more, even opening the doors to vertical farming saving land from needing to be cleared for farms. Opening up new worlds to explore and settle, or to build from scratch as orbital space habitats, will probably improve our skills at ecology, genetics, and geoengineering, even if we don't absolutely need to travel to new worlds to improve those skills with Earth and its needs right here. They give us places for people to grow in and to compete for, so not every bit of human ambition is being exercised here on Earth complete with clashes. Clashes that can involve titanic resources and doomsday devices. You can send a lot of your folks to new worlds who need that challenge, that chance to climb and forge a place for themselves in civilization and in history books. It also does not pay dividends to hold off on investing. We may not need some vast interplanetary empire to build a good asteroid shield, but it's a heck of a lot easier to do both in tandem. All the research, funding, basic infrastructure and so on for both those things is very related, and if a devastating asteroid does come down toward Earth in the year 2300, I'd give us much better odds of seeing and handling that, and more easily, if we have hundreds of outposts and colonies scattered around the solar system than if all we have is a satellite grid. Same, it is so much easier to deal with even natural disasters like supervolcanoes if you've got that huge space infrastructure and also means you have folks with resources safely located off-planet, who can come help us out if things go very badly, like friendly countries helping another that just got smashed by an earthquake or hurricane, and that orbital infrastructure does permit weather control to prevent hurricane. Now, each of those outposts is the seed of a future rival, and potentially a hostile threat. We shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that we can just ignore that or that those opposed to space colonization are going to bring that up. This is one of the reasons we're focusing as much on the flaws in the arguments for space colonization we often hear as saying what benefits it brings, 
Because we might all be pro-space, but there are going to be folks who aren't, and who bring up good or resonating points. Each of those little seeds is one more place that might trade with us, that might invent some new wonder, might help us in our hour of need, and might be home to our great-great-grandchildren. But also, home to some berserk AI recklessly made fall from scrutiny, or doomsday device, or greedy or fanatical faction hoping to screw us, though they also might be the rebels that came and saved us from some global police state dictator or such too, either serving as havens for those escaping it or coming back with a fleet to topple it. Those seeds are just seeds, probably not any better or worse than what we sow here on Earth, except they are far more numerous and also not just humans. As we saw in episodes like Evacuating Earth, Exporting Earth, or Seed Ships, we don't really need that much more technology to be able to send out the sum totality of all life forms on Earth and set them up elsewhere, to grow and change and grow some more on new worlds or around new sun. If Earth is not synonymous with humanity, I think we could say it is synonymous with its biosphere. I don't think folks really worry about saving Earth and think about protecting the mantle or core. They mean the life on it, and driving out to space saves those by transplanting them elsewhere, but also by giving us all the knowledge and resources we need to keep Earth a protected planet and do so long after our sun, or any natural sun, burns out. And if something happens to Earth anyway, then most of what we really mean by Earth, us and its other life forms in its history, can be saved in some way, by placing its descendants on 10 billion other worlds, even if one of those comes and destroys us one day. It's not that Earth's future, or humanity's, is guaranteed by making our way out into the galaxy, it's that fundamentally, if we do not, the only guarantee about our future is that it comes with an expiration date. So one of the things we were focusing on today, and a couple weeks back in our Solar System Colonization Strategies episode, is that while most of us involved in the show, watching or creating, are huge fans of space exploration for its own sake, that is not universal, and probably wouldn't be the major drive for exploration or colonization by everyone else. I did get reminded by a lot of folks after that episode that while that's probably true, the sheer excitement and enthusiasm for the Apollo missions all around the globe is also an important reminder that curiosity and a love of exploration is an almost universal human trait. Incidentally, speaking of the Apollo missions, I wanted to give a shout out to astronaut turned author Chris Hadfield's new book, The Apollo Mortals, and congratulate him on that becoming an almost instant international bestseller. He is my favorite Canadian astronaut in large part for all his efforts to make life on the space station interesting and transparent to all of us. I frequently use footage of him in our episodes doing just that. I've gotten to chat with him recently in regard to future writing projects of his, and since it's Thanksgiving it's a good chance to say that one of the things I'm thankful for is meeting all the amazing folks and having all the fascinating conversations I've gotten as a result of producing this show. If you are a Hadfield fan, he also has a video, Miniverse, over on Curiosity Stream. As you know, I often write episodes way out and have been doing our January episodes of late, and those have been on topics like revitalizing Project Orion, the spaceships driven by nukes, and the feasibility of terraforming Mars with nukes, and writing those and coming back to finish up this episode made me think how nuclear bombs can save Earth might be an amusing topic too. So I thought we would do it as a short addendum to today's episode over on Nebula, and maybe expand it down the road into its own episode. That is one thing I like about Nebula, I don't really have to worry about if additional episodes or segments would screw up our channel's viewership via YouTube's arcane algorithms, and another thing I'm thankful of is just how much Nebula has grown since about a dozen of us decided to give it a whirl. I'm pretty sure our episode The Paperclip Maximizer was the first Nebula original to premiere too. And none of that would have been possible without all the loyal fans of those shows helping fund the experiment and putting up with the early clunky user interfaces and lag while those got improved, you all made Nebula possible. And also thanks to CuriosityStream, which in addition to sponsoring a ton of our episodes, has been giving out free access to Nebula for joining up with them. As always, you can subscribe to Nebula all by itself, but why not get both Nebula and CuriosityStream, the home of thousands of great educational videos like Chris Hadfeld's Miniverse, and all the great content over on Nebula for myself and many others, like our extended edition of today discussing how nukes can save Earth, and you can get all of that for less than $15 by using the link in the episode's description. 
So that will wrap us up for today, but not for the month, as we still have our live stream Q&A coming up this Sunday at 4pm Eastern Time. For those who often ask, while the focus is on science, yes you can ask about sci-fi too, and based on my notifications everyone seems to be really interested in my takes on the recent adaptations of the Foundation, Dune, and Wheel of Time, so feel free to ask about those this weekend. That will take us into December and we will start off with a look at how miniaturization and digital mind uploading can impact the Fermi Paradox, and we will follow that up with a look at upcoming advances in material science on December 9th. Then we'll have our Sci-Fi Sunday episode on December 12th to look at folks staking and jumping claims on asteroid mines and similar. As always, if you want to get notified about those episodes, make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. And if you like this episode, you can hit the like button, share it with others, or support the show by visiting our website or Patreon, or any of our social media, all of which are linked in the episode description. From all of us here at SFIA, Happy Thanksgiving, assuming you celebrate it, thank all of you for making this show great, and we'll see you next week.